like to begin tonight and tell you about my story, God's grace and mercy in my life. My story started in the year 2000. Went to see my primary care doctor complaining of a little bit of feeling blue sadness, and he put me on some antidepressants and went back to see him again a little bit later, complaining again that those pills weren't working. So he upped him a couple of dosage, so I took a couple more pills, went back to see him again, and uh, complaining of my heart pounding so hard it felt like it was in my throat. And he said, well, we're going to try some other pills, gave me some more pills, went back again, crying, sad, blue. He's like, you're crazy. You need to go see somebody else that can handle you. And I uh, was referred to a psychologist, a, a talk therapist. They tried all kinds of stuff. The world tells us that uh, maybe try some yoga. Or how about Pilates? How about Tibetan bells? How about meditation? How about group therapy, talk therapy? And uh, those just weren't working. About six months later, I woke up tied to a um, hospital gurney like this. This was at a mental health hospital. I was tied to the gurney in front of a nurse's station. And as I woke up, I saw the nurse passing by, and I said, what am I doing here? And she said, honey, you've tried to hurt yourself, and we're here to help you. And I closed my eyes, and I thought to myself, suicide watch again. Not again. I was moved from the hallway to my private room at the mental health hospital. And I was lying on my bed. And I pulled my legs over to get off the bed to go to the bathroom. And as I looked down at the floor, I could only see piles of cockroaches on the floor, just brown and black roaches. And I just screamed and yelled. And the nurse ran in and she said, what, what's up? And I said, the roaches, can't you see the roaches? They're all over the floor. And she said, there's nothing on the floor. What are you trying to do? I said, I just want to go to the bathroom. So she helps me out, and she escorts me to the bathroom. I needed to splash water on my face. I was just so sick of seeing those visions. And so I turn on the faucet, and out pour black spiders instead of water from the faucet. And I jump back. And I say, God, and I pound my fists on that pretend mirror that they have in the mental health hospitals. I say, I can't do this anymore. It's too much. And I start screaming and yelling in that bathroom. And the nurses and the doctors come on. They take me to my bed, put me down again, give me injections so I could just stay sane for just a few more minutes. The family was gathered together by the doctors, and they said, uh, you have a choice. We can keep her here indefinitely in this mental health hospital, or she can do what's something that's called uh, ECT, electrical shock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy. And my family asked, will mom be able to come home? Will she be able to come home and be with us? They said, yes, we'll do this while she's in the mental health hospital. She'll start her treatments here, and then she'll be able to go home once we, we get her back in a, in a sane position or, or a halfway normal uh, thought process. So I started the electrical shock therapy in the hospital. And for the mental health patients at the local hospital that I was at, they would take you what's called a, a, the cave. The, the nurses and the doctors nicknamed it the cave. It wasn't good enough for the regular patients, but it was fine for the mental health patients that they had. It was dark. It was cold. It was impersonable. They would have us wake up at 7 a.m. in the morning. They would truck us down. We would walk in a single file all the way down to the hospital into the cave. We would get on these dark gurneys. We would change out of our hospital gowns, and we would lay on the gurney until the doctors had time to come in and give us CTs. Sometimes we were there for two hours just waiting while the doctors did whatever it is that they had to do to finally come in and uh, give us our treatments. The ECTs, in conjunction with all the pills that I was taking, was taking about 13 different types of pills in conjunction with the ECT. 
And we're hoping that this would help. So not only was I dealing with all the side effects from the pills I was taking, because I was taking pills upon pills upon pills to help with all the side effects, now I had to deal with the physical effect of an ECT, which meant horrific headaches after the ECT. It meant I felt like my body was beaten with a baseball bat because of the convulsions that the ECT gives you. So I was also taking medication for that. It also erases your memory. Although the, the doctor said, no, it's not the ECT that's erasing your memory. It's the, de the stress from the depression. But blocks of my, my mind are gone because of not only the medication, but also because of the ECTs. The voices that I would hear, major depression is what it's called, is just a hopelessness. You have absolutely no hope in your life whatsoever. You're void of all emotion. I was also diagnosed with psychosis. In psychosis, you hear voices. You see things that aren't there, like the cockroaches, like the spiders, like the woman and the man that would always appear at my, at my uh, kitchen window with a little girl telling me how to harm myself, what pills to take, what knives to use to cut my wrists. This was just an example that I wrote. It says, I am in there somewhere crying in my heart. Please let me depart. I just wanted to get rid of it. I just wanted out of it. If it meant hurting myself, then that's what it meant. But uh, the ECTs, I guess it helped because I was home one day and I don't have a lot of the memory of how this all happened, just God has granted me certain areas of my life that I can now remember. But we got a phone call from this lady, sales lady who wanted to sell us a water softener. And uh, she said, I get credit just to go to your house and, and give you a demo. And I said, okay, come on over. So she came over and we were talking and she did about two hours of a sales presentation. And she said, okay, would you like to buy the water softener? And I said, no, I can't. I can't afford it. And she said, why not? We have payment plans. We could set you up. And I said, well, I'm on disability. And she said, you're on disability. And I said, yes, I'm on disability. For what? And I said, well, I have a major di depression. I have psychosis. I have schizophrenia. With schizophrenia, you're paranoid about everybody about you. You, 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 um, can, you know, just... I, I would think that my husband was trying to kill me. I thought that my sister hated me. We would go to the grocery store and I would end up crouching in a corner because I just thought everyone was staring at me and hated me. And um, so schizophrenia was, was the paranoia that came with the, with the depression and the psychosis. It also, schizophrenia, there's, there's three, there was a form of movement that came with the schizophrenia that I needed. And many times I would end up rocking. I had three forms of movement. Rocking, constant rocking. Constant rocking, no matter where I was at, I would rock, almost like holding on to myself, hoping that something, somehow, this had to end. Then I would wring my finger, my, my hands constantly, constant wringing of my hands. I would also run my fingers through my hair, just constant, just running my fingers through my hair, almost scratching my scalp as to hoping that this stuff would get out of my head. End it now so he can go on living. You have solely sucked all life and spit it back in his face. You are a disgrace. These are the things I wrote in my journal. Many of the pages I tore out because they were so horrific. But the ECTs helped. This woman who came to give us the, uh, the talk about the water softener said, Anita, you're too young to be on disability. And I said, well, I told her about all this stuff that was going on, and she said, you need to get off those pills. And I said, wait a minute, did, did I not tell you, not only do I have um, major depression and psychosis and schizophrenia, but uh, I'm OCD, and I know a lot of people talk about OCD in a joking way, but I had to count. I had to count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 20. I would do that up to 100 as I was rocking as I was wringing my hands, as I was running my fingers through my hair, as I would walk, as I would brush my teeth, as I would do the dishes. Whatever I had to do, it had to have a rhythm of 100. It always had to be 100. Then I go to 200, then 300, then 400. It was the only thing that was helping me to keep myself sane. Then, on top of that, I had the cutting issue. So these um, man and woman and this little girl that would come and appear to me would tell me which knives to take, 
out of the drawer and to cut myself slowly on my wrists until I would feel the blood just pour out and somehow it would renew me. I would feel refreshed by this. The sad part is when I would go see my son and my grandbabies, I would have to have Band-Aids covering my wrists and they would just look and wonder. I also had bulimia, so I would stuff my face and then I would go and vomit it all up and again feel renewed at this horrible, horrible pit that I was stuck in. And as this sales lady talked, she said, get off the pills, Anita. The sales lady telling me, who doesn't even know me, get off the pills. And it wasn't her words that were speaking so loudly to me, but it was like God telling me, have you given up on me? Have you lost hope? Are you believing these lies that they're telling you? That sales lady left that night, and I flushed 12 of the 13 pills down the toilet. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to continue going to ECT. I'm not going to have the, uh, the pills anymore. I'll go see my psychiatrist. I'm not going to tell my family because I know I've tried this before, and they are horrified that I would try it again. So I'll just keep it quiet, and I won't do it. Three months later, I was back at work. It wasn't easy. It was very, very difficult. It's not easy when you're coming back, back into the world after all that kind of madness that, that one can get stuck in. It is a spiritual warfare. It is real. I'm not telling you this to be a horrific storyteller so you could hear this horribleness, but I'm telling you this so that you can hear and understand the grace of God, his mercy, his long suffering, his love for us is absolutely true. It's not just a book that we carry, we call the Bible, it's the living word. He granted me a ministry called Surrender to Hope for women who suffer from depression to let them know there is hope. There is hope beyond what you think, what the world tells you. There is hope beyond what your family thinks, your friends think, what those pills are telling you. There is hope, and it's in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And he is a mighty God that we serve. And I thank you tonight for your time. Amen.